Welcome to Screenplay. I'm Sid Field. And we're here at the Writers Guild Foundation, Shavelson Webb Library, with our screenwriting guest, Simon Kinberg. Simon, welcome Thanks. to Screenplay. Thank you for having me. I've, I've always thought that the art of screenwriting is finding places where silence works mm. better than words. Mm. And it took me years to understand that concept because mm. you, you always want to explain in terms of dialogue what the story's around. Yeah. And you have this wonderful ability to show the picture with a minimum of dialogue yeah. in order to move that story forward and illustrate character as well. Yeah, it's so true. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's entirely true. And, and, and the greatest filmmakers are the ones that understand how to use silence and obviously mm -hmm. imagery. It's a lesson that I didn't learn until the first day I was on set um, of a movie, and the first movie I was ever on the set of was Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Mm. And we were shooting the first day up, we shot um, the opening of the movie, them in the marriage therapist's office. Yes. And I sat down and Doug Lyman, the director, who I'm sure we'll talk about because I'm working with him again on Jumper and he's become one of my closest friends. He's an incredibly inclusive, mm -hmm. collaborative, um, curious, constantly mm. wanting new ideas, um, voracious director. So every morning, as I would eventually find out, but that morning it started, um, we would spend two or three or four hours with the actors before we ever rolled any film. Just talking about the scene, mm. rewriting the scene, rethinking the scene. Sometimes I'd rewrite the scene 25 times over the span of those few hours to come back to the original structure with one new line, one new tweak. Um, but that first day, I remember we were sitting there and, and I remember Angelina saying, there's a moment and it's, it's in the movie where, oh, maybe it's not in the movie actually, where she, she, it's when she comes back to the therapist, therapist by herself and the line was something like, when we married, he was so electric and now he's just dead, something like that. Mm -hmm. And she said, can I do this? When we married, he was so, uh, and now he's just, and she did it with yeah. the face and I, so much more real, Yes. Um, so much more human. And, um, and part of the, the art of being a screenwriter is creating a universe and characters and a story and yet being transparent in that creation. That was the first time I realized silence is so much stronger. Um, and throughout making that movie, there were so many times when Brad and Angie just dropped lines or said, you know what, I'm going to try this with a look, a glance. I'm going to stretch this moment out. Um, and it was, that was the real learning experience for me. I mean, in the, in the beginning, in the therapy session, in the very first scene in the film, you could see there was silence that was built into their yeah. interaction. And I thought that was just lovely. It just held me there to the screen looking at that. Yeah, and you know, part of the trick of that too was something that Doug did. And Doug is fearless at sort of messing with people. Um, even big, huge movie stars like Brad and Angelina. And um, he said, I want the first day up to be those five pages of dialogue mm. in a therapist's office. And, you know, Brad and Angie, I think, had met once or twice, but we had no rehearsal time. She was coming right off another movie. She literally had flown in from Africa the day before mm. we shot that. Um, and there we are sitting in a marriage therapist's office with a couple that's supposed to have been married for five or six years. And there is this real awkwardness between these two veritable strangers that is useful to the movie because they're in a bad marriage in which they've become strangers to each other, in, in, in which they are awkward with each other. And, um, you know, that, that's part of Doug's genius, actually, is understanding how to use sort of real life um, re reality, essentially, and fold it into the fiction of the movie. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because the line from the film, I think in the middle of the film, is where John says, you know, at the end, it's always good to look at the beginning, mm -hmm. which I found delightful. Mm -hmm. And it gives you an, a real line into the story of their relationship. Mm. What was the original idea for Mr. and Mrs. Smith? You know, the origin, the impulse mm. of that idea. Um, it was when I was in, in film school. It was my, uh, my second year, and I was actually trying to find uh, an idea for a movie. In your first year, I mean, rather, your first semester of second year, you have to, um, I guess, declare what your thesis is going to be for the subsequent mm -hmm. years. And for screenwriters, it's a feature screen plan. It's trying to come up with an idea. And, I wanted to be a character-driven genre film. You know, I grew up, like I said, with those mm. movies from the 80s that I just loved. I loved John McClane. I loved, mm. I mean, all those characters. I loved Marton Riggs. The two kinds of films I watched were 80s action movies <laughs> and 30s and 40s screwball comedies. Oh, yes. And I loved best. them. Yeah, I mean, the the thin, I, I, I really, when I was a kid, I'd memorized the Thin Man movies, mm. the first three of them. I mean, all of them I'd seen, but the first three especially. The first two were really in my heart of hearts and Bringing Up Baby and His Girl Friday and all of those movies. Um, I'd always wanted to find a way to do my version of a film like that. And so I, I, I didn't have any ideas. And uh, I was actually out to dinner with some friends of mine uh, who were married and hadn't been married long. And they were very open with me and started talking about how they were in marriage therapy. 
And I remember vividly they were telling me that their marriage therapist advocated um, sort of five steps to the evolution of a successful marriage, I guess. And those five steps were, I think, initiation, interaction, communication, compromise, and adaptation. Hmm. And I remember thinking it's a fabulous structural arc mm -hmm. for a relationship in a movie. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like I knew how to tell a story using each of those as the building blocks of the mm -hmm. film. Um, and then the more they started talking about marriage there, because I, but I wasn't going to write Kramer versus Kramer or ordinary right. people, or I, just not the way I write. It's not in my DNA, at least not yet. And and um, and the more they started talking about marriage therapy, the more they started uh, describing their therapist's language, things like you have to stay laser focused. <laughs> um, it, it sounded a little mercenary, and I just thought, what a delicious idea for a movie if mm. the my version of marriage therapy is about a husband and wife trying to kill each other and in the process falling back in love mm. um, and really it came to me I came uh, in that in that dinner the idea of I need to write this as a movie came to me and then on the way home I remember in the cab I was living in New York I thought they're killers and then by the time I got home in some ways the whole structure of the movie um, was in me and I sat down that night for hours and wrote about a three-page treatment, mm -hmm. the first, just for myself, um, that was the arc, the idea, the characters, um, almost all of which remained entirely intact through the, what would become a five-year odyssey to get into the movie screens. Hey guys, we're back with Simon Kinberg. Welcome back, Simon. Thank you. To me, the whole story is like a metaphor of a marriage. Mm. So when you began the story, organizing the story, executing the story, did you begin with that character arc or did you begin with, well, you knew the structure and then you began with a character arc. So for me, the whole film, well, I don't want to say the whole film, but there's a scene in there, the dinner scene, when they first realize that they may be Mm. hunting each yeah. other. Yeah. That to me was so beautiful mm. because it's a, to it's a scene about total subtext. Yeah. You know, what is not said becomes more important than what is said. Yeah. And for the first time, they're really looking at each other. Mm. And I've, how did you go about writing that? Because mm. it's such a delicate scene mm. to write. The balance of going one way or the other way yeah. is so narrow. How did you go about structuring that scene when you wrote it? Well, you know, that's actually my favorite scene in the movie. Um, and it's Doug Lyman, the director's favorite scene in the movie. And I think um, it was Brad and Angie's favorite scene in the movie. Um, What's in the film is ultimately a collaboration between all of us. Um, what you're describing in terms of it's the first time they're looking at each other, that's literally in the exposition in the script. Mm. Um, that it's the first time he's looked at his wife in years and he's noticing, you know, he's looking for bulges on her dress, but noticing, uh. you know, her body for the first time as well. There's a sexuality to the scene that was really important. Um, there is a spark back in their marriage for the first time since the beginning of the marriage. Um, that was in, That is the central idea of the movie. That scene is the central idea of the movie. Mm. Um, and you're right, it's all about what's not being said in the scene. Um, part of the fun of that scene was finding the language with which they could be hinting to the audience in some ways, um, and even to each other without saying what it was they were mm -hmm. thinking. Like when my, my favorite line, my, my proudest line in the movie is when he comes at the beginning of that, when he comes home, and uh, he says, I missed you. And she says, I missed you too. Just a very simple right. sort of you know, almost slapsticky pun, because they've just missed each other trying to kill each other, but um, it sets the tone for the entire thing, because they're saying to each other, they're, they're, from the beginning of that scene, they're testing each other. They're looking, they're saying, I missed you, are you gonna blink? I missed you too, are you gonna blink? And the whole scene is about who blinks first. When I was working with Brad and Angie and Doug on the actual scene, when we were there shooting it finally, um, it, it was sort of wonderful, because it, it went back to Akiva and I talking about the scene for the first time. Akiva said, Every single line in that scene needs to be about something else and you need to know what it's about. Mm. Every single line. So then when finally I was sitting down with them and we're shooting this scene that's a very hard scene to perform, because subtext yes. is hard to perform, um, they are saying, what does this line mean? And I have the answer. I say, this line means this, this line means that. Um, and it allowed them to sort of understand the scene and throw away the lines, because the lines right. were so unimportant. Um, you know, and, and some of it was also about finding physical moments to manifest that rather than verbal moments. One of the very nice moments in it was actually an idea that came from John Woo, um, that she brings out a knife, he brings out a bigger knife, she brings out a bigger <laughs> knife. He wanted to be in the kitchen, but you see it in the thing when they're doing, you know, he, she has the bread knife and he's cutting the pot roast. Um, that, you know, that kind of finding physical manifestations rather than just verbal was really important to the scene. 
Um, and there was a one of my favorite moments in it, only because of where it came from, was a discovered moment on the set uh, with Brad, where the first time he thinks his food is poisoned, right? And um, as scripted, he uh, takes a bite of his food and then he puts it in his napkin and puts it under you know the table. And we shot that. And the next day, Brad showed up on set and he said, you know, I think that was a mistake. I think it gives her too much of an advantage in the mm. scene. If we're really ping-ponging, if we're really playing tennis back and forth, and each of us is move, counter, move, move, counter, move, that's actually um, a step backwards. And each step in the scene needs to be a step forward. Each step in the scene needs to be sort of just subtly pushing them mm. toward, you better tell me the truth, I know the truth, I'm getting close to the truth. Uh, that was somehow... Um, a de-escalation, you know, it was a gear shift down and he wanted to constantly be, gear we all wanted to constantly be gear shifting up so the tension, you know, a scene like that, it's all about tension and tension, you don't ever want to um, puncture the tension. You right. always want the tension to be getting tighter and tighter. So that next day, we sort of looked at each other, I remember, and we said, you're absolutely right. You should swallow that, you know, piece of food in your mouth saying, fuck <laughs> you, I know, you know, and I'm, I'm fearless and you're now up against somebody that's as good as you. Mm. Um, and he does it in, in such a sort of demonstrative, silly way. That's uh, it's kind of lovely. It's a beautiful shot of him when he swallows that food. Yeah. I, it just stuck, I didn't know anything about that, but it yeah. just stuck with me yeah. that he's like making a joke about it and he's showing his strength yeah. and he just swallows the food. Yeah. And then, of course, it goes to, to uh, pour the wine right. and drops the bottle and right. she catches it. Right, which is a ripoff from Crouching Tiger, Little yes. Hidden Dragon, by the way, um, that I got called on all the time on set. But... Uh, you yeah, know, it's it's all about how close can you get without saying what you really want to say. Yes. And I think, I think you know, at the, when I first wrote Mr. and Mrs. Smith, um, I was single. And over the span of the development of it, I met my wife and got married. And, okay. and I have many more friends who've gotten married over the span of, of the last five, six years as well. And um, the more I am around married couples and I'm a married person myself, um, the more I understand the movie, strangely. So much of marriage is about what's not said, you know? So much of marriage is not... I'm upset with you because you don't pay attention to me. It's, are you going to open the car door or not? You know, and it's, screenwriting is about finding ways to dramatize, you know, yes. I'm angry at you, not having them say I'm angry at you. Do you have a favorite scene in the movie? Well, the, you know, the, the, the scene that you cited is, is probably my favorite scene, the, the, the dinner table. Um, for personal reasons, I also really love... Um, the scene with Vince Vaughn and Vince's uh, oh, kitchen. Oh, that must have been. <laughs> that was amazing. How is it like to work with him? Uh, it's like being in the middle of a hurricane, <laughs> you know, and just trying to hold on for dear life, um, but seeing things you've never seen before. Um, the first day, that day was Vince's first day on the movie. And we were shooting with Brad, um, the scene where he's with Michelle Moynihan, actually, in the, in the little shop. And Doug came to me and he said, listen, Vince is here. Um, it's his first day, it was like seven in the morning. Uh, he's not really going to be uh, shooting until probably like 7 or 8 o'clock tonight. So why don't you go into his trailer and just hang out with him for a little bit? And I didn't know much about Vince other than he was 6 foot 5 inches tall and like a little a little uh, ornery. Um, and I went to his trailer and he was chain smoking. I had already like five cigarettes in his, in his ashtray. It was like a cloud of smoke came the second I opened the trailer door. And I came and he said, close the door, close the door. And I came to the trailer and he said, let's, uh, let's play, you know, play with the scene a little bit. And he's this incredible just ball of manic mm. energy. Um, talks five times faster than I do, constantly pacing around, constantly has something in his hand, usually a cigarette. And uh, he said, let's just play around with the scene. So I said, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll run the lines with you. And that scene in the script was about a half a page long. It's like Brad saying, I think it was Brad saying the equivalent of, my wife tried to kill me, um, what are you talking about? Vince says, she tried to kill me with a car, she used the shooter, Vince saying, that's impossible, and him saying, no, it's not. I mean, that's pretty much the scene. <laughs> So I said, let's, okay, we can run the scene together. The lines are pretty easy. And uh, he said, no, no, just put the scene away. You know, let's just play a little bit. <laughs> and playing um, turned out to be six or seven hours in mm. his trailer, nonstop, oh him goodness. chain smoking, me being literally asphyxiated, and just trying to scribble down as fast as I could the insanity that was coming out of his mouth. And every now and then I would lob a question in just to keep him going. But for the most part, it was just this really, like, genius insane mm. monologue. All the stuff in the movie about the, all the texture of the character in the movie lives with his mother, as messy as he is. He had this whole backstory about him being divorced and seeing his wife with a realtor. So specific is improv. And then he would say things like, my favorite line that we never used in the movie, he started talking about he's, he's dating a 17 year old girl now, the character, Eddie, and I was like, okay. Um, 
when, you know, when you're improving with an actor, all you really want to do is ask them questions right. just to guide them a little bit. And I said, so what do you guys have in common? And he said, we have a lot in common. You know, we, uh, we play video games together. Uh, I helped her bedazzle her jean jacket. <laughs> and I remember being like, that's so specific and insane. <laughs> it, I've got to find a way to put it in the movie. <laughs> and, and he is just um, reckless and uh, wild um, and profane in all the ways you want. He, that day, we just created the character. And so it was a really special day. And Doug came in, then they broke for lunch, six hours later, whenever, and Doug came into the trailer and, and he said, so how's it going? And I said, it's great. And I had a pad, literally like this full, just of all the notes I'd taken. I, I literally had to um, ice my wrist at the end of the day because I'd been writing so much, truly. They had like a bowl with ice and it was just icing my wrist. And I said, here, l listen to the scene. And I read the scene to him and it was just like a four page monologue. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, it's funny. But, you know, Brad Pitt's kind of a movie star, and I don't think he can just sit in the scene and listen. Um, and I said, oh, yeah, no, you're right, you're right, you're right. So then I had to restructure the scene, and I kept the sort of basic structure of the original scene. I just filled in all those moments hmm. with Vince's um, genius, and uh, we didn't show it to Brad. And we just came, and Brad had then, by that point, it was like 9 o'clock at night, and he'd been shooting all day, and he thought he was just going to shoot a half-a-page scene and go home. And uh, first take, <laughs> up. Vince suddenly starts going crazy and you know spouting all this stuff and a bunch of stuff that's not in the movie. I think it's in the director's cut DVD as a supplement or anything. But I mean, there's even more than that. He's talking about you know she's going away with Iranian princes and just like really specific <laughs> in lunacy. And Brad's looking at the camera, being like, "What's going on? Like I don't understand. What movie is he in?" Um, and then you know adjusted to it and uh, and we went from there. But that for that reason, because of that day, because it was so special, um, that's one of my favorite scenes in the movie too. I'd like to talk a little bit about X-Men 3. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, coming in after two films have already been made, mm -hmm. stories have already been done, developed, a universe has been created. Mm -hmm. How would, was it coming into that in terms of creating a story, working with, I, I guess it was two directors, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Tell me wh how you got into that and how it developed uh, story-wise and working with director-wise and so on? Um, how I got into it in terms of how I got the job was that, um, you know, I, I found that getting jobs in, in, in this industry is a little bit like a domino effect. You hit one domino and then it leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And Mr. and Ms. Smith uh, established a relationship between myself and Regency um, Films, produced Smiths. They produced a movie called Electra, which wasn't a particularly good mm -hmm. movie. At one point over the span of making that film, they called me up and said, will you give us three days in the movie, just come and rewrite a couple scenes. I did that. It was, you know, uh, as good as I guess I could yeah. do under the circumstances. And and then on the other side of that, um, Fox, 20th Century Fox, um, when they were working on Fantastic Four, called me up and said, we're in a lot of trouble and we start shooting in two months. Um, will you come in and do a, a pretty radical rewrite of the script? I did that. I ended up living on that movie for about two, three months. Um, and then when X-Men 3 came around, what happened was Brian Singer was going to direct the movie. His writers, um, Dan Harris and Mike Doherty, um, who wrote mm -hmm. X2, who wrote Superman for him, who, with whom he works very closely, were going to write X3 for him because they have a working relationship. Like Doug Liman and I have like a lot of directors and writers. Um, Brian left the movie to direct Superman. When he did that, he took Mike and Dan, mm -hmm. his writers, with him to write Superman. So there was this hole there. There was no director and there was no writer and no script. They'd never even written an mm -hmm. outline. So the studio called me um, because we had you know, some success with Smiths and with Fantastic Four and said, are you interested in doing X-Men 3? And I said, very much. Um, the challenge of coming in to do a sequel is that you sort of have to do two things that seem diametrically opposed. You have to be true to the essence and the tone and the universe and the characters mm -hmm. of the previous films. You also have to make it different. Right. It's not different if it just feels like it's um, another episode of the same show with the same procedure, people aren't going to come to see it. There has to be something that makes it special, that makes it um, a gear shift up right. from the previous films. Uh, and I didn't know what that was going to be. And that was quite daunting. I, mm. I, I, I did know one thing, which is part of why um, I said yes so readily. I knew that the movie was going to be the Dark Phoenix Saga. The Dark Phoenix Saga is um, the story of Jean Grey coming back from the dead as, as an evil character and as the most powerful mutant in this mutant universe. And has that been a story in the comic strip as it's well? It's the most famous story okay. in the history of the comics. Uh -huh. um, created by Chris Claremont, uh, who's a really great comic writer. It was one of the most, if not the most radical story runs in the history of all comics. Mm. Um, because it's very rare in comics, if ever, that you have 
a hero come back as a villain and sustain their role yes. as a villain. Sometimes you'll have Superman come back as bad Superman, or Spider-Man will sort of lose his mind because of Venom for a, you know um, a book or two. But this was a real sort of mm. you know well evolved multi um, book story uh, that became um, sort of a lightning rod for other comic books. And uh, Brian, obviously, at the end of X2, had set up the Dark Phoenix story because she dies at the end of it. And then at the very right. end, Professor Xavier sort of has this sixth sense. And then you see, if you watch it, there's an outline of a phoenix bird in the water where she died at the end of X2. Um, so he had set it up. He, his intention was to tell the Dark Phoenix story with X3. I knew that's what we had to do. So that was very exciting to me. Um, but what was challenging, among many challenges in that movie, uh, was that that wasn't enough for the sequel. Because, to be very frank, Fonka Jansen is not as big a movie star as Hugh Jackman or Halle right. Berry or even Ian and Patrick in some ways. You couldn't have a whole sequel that was just about her character. So we had to find a parallel story right. um, that possibly could dovetail into it, but at the very least could stand on its own as an idea. The fanboys and um, you know people maybe like you and I who are interested in more dramatic movies could 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 grab hold right. of the Dark Phoenix right. story, but a broader audience needed something broader in exactly. appeal. Um, and that was something that um, took us quite some time to discover. And it was something that I have to say came from a studio executive. A studio executive mm -hmm. at Fox named Alex Young, who was the executive on the project, he was, as we all were, going through all these old X-Men comics, trying to find the spark for some other mm -hmm. story that would be big enough. And he found a series, a fairly recent one, about a cure for mutancy. Mm -hmm. That actually, ironically, the comic book was written by Joss Whedon. Mm -hmm. um, so we owe quite a debt to Joss as well. Um, and once he came up, he brought this idea of the, of the, the mutant cure to us. Um, I, myself, the producers, studio, the other executives all felt like that's a big uh -huh. idea for a movie. Yes. Um, it's a lightning rod of a political, a philosophical, a personal um, issue, and it's big enough that you can actually, in some ways, organize a huge conflict or a war around this idea. Um, so once he came up with that idea, we were sort of off to the races, and then we knew we were telling both the Dark Phoenix story and the Mutant Cure story. Now, you co-wrote this with Zach Pan. I did. How did that come about, that whole collaboration? That was pretty interesting. Um, and it's interesting that we're here in the Writers Guild, actually, because it was um, fairly anomalous to the Guild, um, what we ended up doing. You know, we're accredited as a writing team. There's an ambersand between us, not, a, not the word and. I'd never worked with a writing partner before, nor had I ever met Zach Penn. Um, what happened was the studio, as I was writing my first draft, did what they and all studios now do on a lot of these big movies, especially when they have an accelerated pre-production um, period, which is they hire more than one writer mm. to write simultaneous separate mm. drafts. Their idea is that they'll get lots of good bits and pieces from each of the writers, sometimes as many as four or five. I know a summer movie that was out a lot. This last summer had five different writers sim writing si simultaneously five different scripts. <laughs> then what they do is they get um, another writer after they've fired those writers or, you know, paid them for their draft, to then create a sort of Frankenstein draft mm. of the bits and pieces, the arm and the leg from the different scripts. That's what I did on, on Fantastic Four. And unintentionally, they, they had hired a bunch of different writers to write simultaneously. They got rid of all of them. They gave me something like seven or eight different scripts and said, now make, oh, you know, a soup goodness. out of it. They think it's like you give, you give a writer ingredients. Right. Um, but actually, all it ensures is that it's going to be a ruined soup unless you start from scratch. Because you can't write um, a story made from bits and bobs. Right. It's different voices, they're different stories, they're different emotions. Um, so the studio hired both of us to write simultaneously. Um, and Zach and I uh, contacted each other. We have a lot of mutual friends that we'd never met. And we said, this is crazy. We're just going to write our separate drafts, they're going to fire us. Did you call or did he call he you? He emailed or? me. He uh -huh. emailed me and said, hey, how's it going? I mean, right. something really innocuous. And I wrote back something like, you know, it's nice to hear another voice from the cell next door. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe we should sit down. And I went over to his office, and we sat down, and I, we just got along. Like he's become a really good friend of mine. Mm. Um, we have very similar sensibilities in general, and I think we had a very, I know we had a very similar take on the movie. Um, so at the end of that, there was no agenda. It was really just let's just meet this other person so it's not as ugly as right. looking over my shoulder and worrying about who's going to deliver first and is he doing better than I am and all of the things that neurotic writers or anybody would be plagued by. Uh, by the end of that, we looked at each other and we're like, you know what, we should, maybe we should try doing this together. Mm. Um, and we called the studio and we said, listen, um, we're going to write a draft together as opposed to two separate drafts. And I think at first 
they were a little terrified by that. I can imagine. For a lot of reasons. Yes. One, because they don't feel like they're getting their money's worth, because they're getting one draft instead of two. Uh -huh. I mean, they're, they're that sort of simple and, and business-like. Two, I think, because it, it, it robbed them of a certain amount of authorship, actually. Um, instead of now being the dictators and taking the drafts and mm. handing them to a new person, there were these two people conspiring um, in, a, in a cell that they didn't have access to. Uh, and so, begrudgingly, they said, okay. Um, I guess probably assuming that if it didn't work out, they would then hire right. our equivalent to rewrite us. And, um, and it did work out. Um, it was the first time I'd worked with a writing partner. It was not his first time. He'd worked with a lot of writing partners over mm -hmm. his career. He's had a long career. He's been writing. He's young, but he was writing since he was 20. He's been, his first movie was The Last Action Hero when he was yes. like 22 years old. And uh, so he's been doing this for 15, 16, however many years. Um, he, uh, we, it was, it was interesting because our process evolved as it went because we didn't have yes. any experience together. So what we did really, what we ultimately settled on fairly quickly was um, we outlined, we beat out, it was a little bit like TV writing. We broke the story together. We beat out all the scenes of the story. We had a very rigid, rigorous structure. We had a very detailed outline. It was probably like 25 pages long. Every scene. Um, and you did that together? Together. In person? In or person. Uh, in person, in yes. his office almost always. We would just sit there. We'd put the note cards on the wall. Uh, we note carded the scenes. Yes. Um, it's a complicated movie that really needs that kind of note carding because there's so many plots to balance. Um, we would color, you know, coordinate the note cards. The Phoenix Store would be one color. The, right. the Cure plot would be another. Uh. So we would always know if it was being balanced or imbalanced because you could just see it visually. Yes. Um, and then we would each take a scene and then we would go off on our separate corners or separate houses or whatever, or separate states sometimes, write our separate scenes, hand them to each other, and then rewrite each other. Mm -hmm. And just, we would keep going that way. Um, and it was a wonderful process. It was, uh, we were a real team in an environment where we probably needed right. a louder voice exactly. than a singular writer would have had. Exactly. Um, and it allowed us to be the only writers in the movie from start to finish, which is very rare on yes. a movie like this. Um, and then once the movie started shooting, Zach's wife had a, had, a, had a baby, and so he started spending a little more time at home. And we just kept working together, even though I spent the bulk of the time up in Vancouver. Mm. Every day, or pretty much every day, I would call him, email him, saying, this is what we're doing, we need a line here, what about this? This came up in rehearsal this morning. Um, it was this very fluid, uh, you know, incredibly intimate process. Um, that kept us sane, certainly kept me sane through the rainy right. nights and, and all the drama right. and all the twists and turns and changing directors and all that. We were the continuity of the movie right. because we didn't have a singular director. We had a director leave, we had another one come in, always in some ways catching up to the movie because he didn't have right. enough prep time. Um, the producers were not um, there all the time, so we were strangely the glue on the film and the actors would come to me a lot of the time on set and say, where am I in this scene? Where was I a scene before? They wanted them. They wanted the forest right. view right. that, in some ways, having been there from the beginning, allowed us to have. How is it dealing knowing that there are four or five writers going to be following your draft? How do you feel about that when you're even writing the first words on paper draft? Yeah, it's a complicated thing writing screenplays in Hollywood because, um, unfortunately, and this is something that a lot of my friends and peers and 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 Akiva, my mentor, are, are trying to um, change. But still, studios, when it comes to these big movies, um, whether it be a big comedy with Jim Carrey or a big action movie with Tom Cruise, or well short of that, they still treat writers as disposable right. and interchangeable. And for whatever reason, the system has evolved to a place where um, having five writers' names on um, the cover of a screenplay makes them feel more confident than having mm -hmm. one writer's name, uh, which is... Misguided. I mean, it's totally. sort of intuitively misguided. Um, and uh, you know, I, I worked in a. I worked one day on a movie. I mean, this is just. How do you ask a writer to work one day on a movie? It was a terrible, terrible movie called Catwoman, and they brought me in with a bunch of other writers and write Academy Award winning writers, hmm. um, other right highest and just big, big writers. Who's um, and they said, okay, you have a day. Try to fix it. Hmm. And the script was so fundamentally broken that if I had a month, I probably couldn't have fixed it. But um, the more people you throw at a screenplay like right. that, the more diffused it's going to get, the more the, it's not going to have a consistency of voice, of tone, of storytelling, exactly. of characters. Are gonna, and um, at the end of the day, I remember I got sent the, at the when this film wraps, the Writers Guild sends um, the final draft to all of the writers who's, who worked in it to see if they want to arbitrate for credit, which I was not going to do <laughs> for a million reasons, but uh, among them that I only work today. Uh, but I, the, the, the title page of that movie was two pages long because of all mm. the writers' names on it. 
And I looked at it and I was like, this is so fundamentally broken. And I hadn't seen the movie yet. I didn't even read the final script. I said, just from looking at those pages, mm -hmm. I know the movie will be fundamentally broken. I don't care how good or how good how it looks. I don't care how great the guy's direction is. It does not ma matter. It cannot be a coherent story when there are that many voices in it. And one of the things that I've really fought to do on my films is be the last writer on, not the only writer. I mean, on Mr. Smith, I was not the only writer. I was the first and I was the last and I was there throughout all of it. Yeah. But when Nicole Kidman was on the movie, she brought on some writers that are, a lot of movie stars have writers that are their go-to right. writers, that know their voices. And, and many times it's valid because I don't know Nicole's voice the way that somebody who's worked on four movies with her knows it. Um, and she brought those writers on and I worked with those writers and oversaw them to some extent. And then she left the movie and so did you know, pretty much all their work. And it, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to stay on a movie and part of the way you have to do that as a writer is you have to ingratiate yourself to the actors and to the director. You mm -hmm. really have to become um, integral to their process. You have to become someone that the, the director and the actors want at rehearsal every morning to fix the pages. Um, you have to become someone that they turn to um, for advice because otherwise the studio's instinct is going to be to replace you right. with someone else because part of it is control. You know. If a studio can keep replacing writers, they can keep dictating to that writer right. what they want in the script. They're not going to get a writer that becomes um, intractable, that becomes so connected to the screenplay that they have some ownership over it. I've worked, you know, I've worked on these movies. I worked on Catwoman for a day. I worked on uh, Electra for a few days. I worked on Fantastic Four for a few months. I worked on Charlie's Angels for uh, a few weeks. I know that experience. You do not have the sense of connection to the screenplay that you would mm. if you're on it from the beginning or if you know you're going to be on it through the end. You just don't, you can't. It's, it's like babysitting a child as opposed to it being your own or even adopting it. Like rewriting is like adopting. Right. Starting from scratch is like your biological kid, right. I guess to some extent. I wouldn't know. I mean, adopting wise. And, and those little weekly rewrites are babysitting. And you don't have the same emotional connection to something you're babysitting. Yes. You just can't. And when you don't have an emotional connection to the thing you're writing, you don't write as well. And that's one of the reasons that movies are not as good um, now as they probably were yes. in the 80s or the 40s or the 50s, you know, whenever. In the 70s, when there were a, a, a more singularity of vision, a singularity exactly. of voice. Um, and this phenomenon of hiring separate writers to write separate screenplays of the same movie is asinine. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's, it's counterintuitive, it's counterproductive, it's incredibly expensive to studios, um, but it allows them the sort of buffet version of being at a restaurant. Mm. You don't have to choose something on the menu. You can go and look at everything that's on the menu and pick, uh, I want one carrot from this, I want the rice from that, I want the leg from the chicken, and I want the, you know, a, a piece of sirloin. Um, at the end of the day, that's not, if you look at that right. on your plate, it doesn't really make any sense. You know, you're eating a carrot with a piece of, it doesn't make any sense. There's not a singularity of, um, of intention. I, I, when I came on to Jumper, this movie I'm working on now with Doug, um, I said, I, I, I want to come on to it because I want to work with Doug again, and I like the story. Um, but I'm only going to do it if you guys make me a producer on it, and mm. you tell me to my face that I'm going to be the last writer on the movie. Hey, yeah, you don't have to put it in my contract because you can't. They can't put it in my contract. I think legally, but just tell me to my face I'm going to be the last writer on it. Um, that was really important to me because knowing there's somebody that's going to come after you or worrying and looking over your shoulder um, infects the way you work. Yes. Um, you don't write with the same freedom because part of the process of writing is you have to be willing to make mistakes. And when you know that if you make too many mistakes, you're going to get um, fired, you don't take the same chance as you would if you know you're on for the mm -hmm. long haul. And I watch it. It's like every director gets 20 takes for every setup, right? And every setup, every scene has five setups. You work with someone like Brett Ratner, 25 setups. Um, they get a lot of chances to get the scene right. As a writer, you get a draft. You get two drafts, maybe three, for the most part, right. usually, before you get replaced. Um, you don't do your best work. Um, what happens is you have a the scripts have a breadth of voices rather than a depth of a voice. Right. You don't, with each, it's just like any relationship. With each draft, you know it a little better. Um, you become a little more fluent in it, and it becomes better for that. When you hire a new writer, that writer starts from zero, and that writer has to learn and become intimate with the script all over, and when that writer has a day or a week or even two months, it's not the same as living, I lived with Mr. Mr. for five years. Hmm. You know, I lived with X-Men for a year and a half from beginning the very end, I was in the editing room with Brett doing ADR. If they hired some random guy to do ADR for the thing and just took the studio's dictates, it wouldn't have the same texture or the same truth to the characters as somebody who's lived with those characters in the rain for two months, you yes. know? Who's lived with them for a year and a half in his mind. Uh, that kind of 
um, emotional and creative investment is integral to making movies because it's a long drawn out process yes. and there's so many people in the midst of it. And unfortunately, the studios haven't figured that out yet. But it is something that, uh, for my part, I'm trying to change. There's this other strange <clears throat> thing that studios do, which is, um, and I understand it, uh, as someone that chops for clothes in nice stores that have the same names usually, like, it's brand shopping. Right. It's, I want this person's name on the cover page, right. and this person's name on the cover page, and this person's name on the cover page, because that means I spent $5 million on the script, which is going to tell Hugh Jackman or Tom Cruise or right. Brad Pitt or whoever that we're invested in the movie, and it's going to make it feel like a big event, hmm. even internally in the development process, because these big names are on it. It is really like brand name shopping for writers. A lot of the times, you just get those writers' names on the on the cover page. Right. I don't even think that's conscious. I think it's subconscious. I think it's this feeling of security with names you know, um, as opposed to names that may be the right ones for the movie, right. or that first writer who nobody's ever heard of. Uh, nobody ever heard of me when I wrote Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Like, that's why everybody passed on the, on the you know, one of the reasons everybody passed. They said, I, it sounds kind of like an interesting idea for a script, but who knows if he can execute it. If Akiva went in and pitched it, he would have sold it for right. $4 million. Who right. knows, you know? Um, but uh, it, it is about trusting that the new voices have a singular vision that you want to pursue. You know, because that's that's who's going to be the next filmmakers. That's who's going to be the next exactly. writers. Well, Simon, once again, I want to thank you for joining us and and really sharing your knowledge, your expertise, your understanding of what's happening in Hollywood today, and especially from the screenwriting point of view. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So thank you, and I wish you the best of luck in all your projects. Thanks. And just keep passing it on and passing it on and passing it on.